You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Tuesday, January 15th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, hearings on would-be A.G. William Barr start, have already started, they're actually ongoing, amid his promise to allow the Mueller investigation to proceed, but is that enough? Meanwhile, Republicans shocked to discover Steve King is a racist, and they are mad. Very upsetting when you find something shocking out like that. Judge orders the census citizenship question struck from the 2020 census, and the Supreme Court saves the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau for the moment. Meanwhile, ACA birth control mandate remains, and Democrats begin investigations into the family separation policy as the shutdown adds 20,000 cases a week to the immigration backlog. Uh, Good news! Ice loss from the Antarctica is not eight times faster than it was 40 years ago. It's only six times faster oh, everybody than it was breath. 40 years ago. Don't yeah. worry about it. Phew. Yeah. And um, speaking of the environment, the EPA enforcement is almost non-existent right now at a record low. We are just hours away from a vote in the British Parliament on a Brexit plan, I guess. Uh, Leadership in the UK is basically in the balance. And Rand Paul has escaped to Canada. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Constitution. Yeah, we will. Uh, we will get to that. Um, he got beat so bad, he became a socialist. The, uh, there, we're also. We'll also talk about this. Um, uh, apparently, the, the five alarm fire that is being caused by a razor company uh, saying that you shouldn't be um, you shouldn't be an a hole in your daily life. Uh, but um, I mean, this is just we're in these sort of like. Um, this is a weird time for politics right now. It is because the government is shut down. The um, the pain that is being caused by this government shutdown is um, not clear to most people unless you know a federal worker. And the damage that it's doing to this country is um, is not obvious. It's like one of those uh, kidney punches, right? Like it starts to uh, cause problems like two or three weeks later. And that's what we're going through now. We're the implications of this. I I had a piece the other day from the, I don't know, the Norman paper in Oklahoma or something talking about how the local services for battered women— and uh, women and children who are victims of domestic violence, uh, they were starting to have to lay off support staff to help uh, folks like this. And so it is always people at the margins who feel this pain first. And um, we go about our daily, uh, daily lives, don't necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily aware of it. And it won't be until we get another couple of weeks where the TSA and maybe the um, the air traffic controllers start to say, like, you know what, I'm sick, I can't come into work today. Where we start, we will start to hear about it. And mark my words on this: when plane travel starts to be constrained, 
we will hear a lot more about it because that's when wealthy people start to be aware of this stuff. And if someone, uh, God forbid, somebody gets super sick uh, from a lack of sort of the the um, consistent FDA inspections, I mean, they're apparently going to be putting uh, inspectors on and deem them as necessary workers for the most high-risk foods. Uh, but broadly speaking, you know, the reason why you do consistent invest, you know, investigations and, uh, and, and scrutiny of the food system, even in the low-risk foods, is that sometimes something happens. Um, but, but mark my words, when the plane travel starts to be impinged, that's when you'll start to hear about it more. And I I imagine a local level, you know, if you live in Iowa or you live in Kansas, you're reading about the farmers are starting to have problems. Um, I would imagine like everybody's got a story around this around the country. But in terms of it being a national story, of course, these things are all regional. That's the whole point of it. It won't be until you get to something like plane travel because that becomes a it's literally a way that the nation is connected and wealthy people. Um, experience it directly. I mean, you, you'd hear about it if um, refund checks are late. Uh, that you'll also hear about. But um, so, uh, but in the meantime, we're you know, it ends up being a culture war, and we end up seeing freak shows like the president of the United States. And look, I don't care that the president of the United States uh, loves fast food. Great. Um, and I don't care about a football team that thought they, you know, got excited about going to visit the white house and they basically end up going through the drive through. Uh, I mean, that seems like a drag, but like castle house. Yeah. But I don't care, uh, really about that. But, um, this is a freak show. I mean, I'm sorry. We're looking at this golden candelabra and <laughs> these uh, Big Macs or whatever it is stacked up on these Carter Pounders on these silver <laughs> trays, and Donald Trump is sitting there like beaming with pride. And uh, I mean, this is uh, I don't I don't even know I don't even know what to it's say. The party it's of Lincoln. Friggin rules. It's uh, the party that? of Lincoln. He finally gets to fulfill his destiny as a burger sommelier. You you watch like things like um the uh like, you know uh, for people who watch Game of Thrones they had this like you know the Mad King was a storyline and you're just like how does stuff like that happen? And then to be living it How is... many nuggets does the Mad King have? <laughs> That's <laughs> <laughs> Now, what's your favorite thing here, Mr. President? I like it all. I like it all. It's all good stuff. Do you great, pre- great American food. Pause it for one second. Just- I'm also like, I'll tell very you something. Very stable, very legal, <laughs> very cool. There were some moves that Anthony Adamrick had on the President Show that I felt were like uh, caric- caricatures of uh, of Trump. And Trump, with his pivoting here, sort of just like swiveling back and forth as if his neck is like doesn't have the ability to move. He moves his whole body like I keep seeing more and more of Anthony Adamerick in the president. Like, I feel like the president is becoming the caricature. Was a good see at the end of this evening, how many are left? Do you prefer McDonald's or Wendy's? I, I like them all. <laughs> That's a tough question. If it's Not a American, softball. I like it. We have the national champion team, as you know, Clemson Tigers, and they had a fantastic game against Alabama, and they're all here, they're right outside the room, and I think we're going to let you uh, see them, but I'll bet you as much food as we have. We have pizzas, we have 300 hamburgers, many, many french fries. Many french all fries. All of our favorite foods. Probably too uh, many to count. I can't go. When we leave, because I don't think it's going to be much reason we did this is because of the shutdown. Uh, we want to make sure that everything is right. So we sent out, we got this, and we have some Why wonderful people working at the White House. They helped us out with this. And uh, I will say the Republicans are really, really sticking 
together. It's great to see because we need border security. We have to have it. We have to have it. No doubt about it. Should have happened 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And it's going to happen now. It's going to happen now. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, en guys. Enjoy your food. Thanks, Thanks guys. Guys. Enjoy the slop that we have presented to you. <laughs> of course. But oh, hell yeah. Where else could you go, though? Like, in my mind, the obvious analog is 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 Obama shutting down the government to, like, expel European immigrants and then inviting, like, some, like, African soccer teams over <laughs> for, like, tahini. It's like, we got the we got tapuli. <laughs> we got grape leaves. We got hummus. i tell you what, we should have gotten rid of people from Norway a long time ago. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. But we're going to do it. Democrats are sticking together, even the devils. And uh, what do you like better, Yemeni food or Iranian food? <laughs> it's all good. Love it all. It all comes from Muslim countries. It's all great. If, if you think that's weird, just wait till he appoints the Hamburglar to the Supreme Court. Yeah, exactly. Here is... It's all great food. It's all great. The, these guys, um, the players come in, and you can hear one of them say, I thought this was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> because they showed up, and someone clearly said, look, guys, we've got a ton of fast food for you. And they're all like, ah, <laughs> we didn't come all the way to the way. Uh, I guess we did. I get three burgers that I could only get if I had about $12 and uh, went down the street and got into the drive through um, Here is Anthony uh, Adamarick um, as, uh, um, as Donald uh, Trump. Where did it go? Did you get it? Yeah, why would Trump ever joke about that? Like, this is his favorite stuff right here. It's finally his time to shine. <laughs> now, the best thing about Wendy's is it's square. <laughs> <laughs> and when it's square, you get the meat, you get more burger. You want to get down and dirty, get some Burger King. That's when everyone, that's when mama's not home to watch you. Mama's not home. <laughs> and you know you can get dirty with him. He's just a little baby. I'm going to throw up. So disgusting. That's... I'm going to throw up. Oh, Jesus. No, I'm not. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sorry, folks. That should have come with a warning. Yeah. Today was the day Donald Trump became president. Indeed. We got uh, Tabole, we got hummus, we got Lebna. <laughs> folks, it's 2019. Are you still doing the uh, doing things the old way at work? Start the year off by replacing that software that caused you angst and agony every day, and find software that fits your business needs using Captera. dot com. Captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business. They have over 700,000 reviews of products from real software users. It has everything you need to make an informed decision. This is the kind of thing that um, I really, I, I fetishize, yes, like uh, review uh, sites. This is what I thought when I saw the ad. I said, oh, Sam fetishizes services like It's this. true. Um, uh, any products I recommend, anything, I go and I read a ton of reviews. You can search more than 700 specific categories of software, everything from project management to email marketing to yoga studio uh, management software, everything. Nice. No matter what kind of software your business needs, Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution fast. Join millions of people who use Captera each month to find the right tools for their business. Visit com slash majority for free today 
to find the right tools to make 2019 the year for your business. Captera.com slash majority. That's Captera, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash majority. And uh, as always, it's it's more than a pleasure uh, to to tell you about the New Yorker. I it literally is something that I brag to my parents about. The New Yorker advertises on the show. Um, it, it represents the best writing in America today, both online and print. New Yorker covers a full range of topics: politics, news, international affairs. Climate change, popular culture, fiction, arts, food, movies, theater, cartoons, uh, not to mention New Yorker touches on subjects that many readers may not have previously put much thought into, like the world's diminishing supply of sand, paper jams, stink bugs, hunting down heirloom beans. Last night, I read The Art of Decision Making which is their lead story. It's sort of fascinating. Um, one of those things where, you know, I end up reading it and then I'm going to read it twice, I think. It also has incredible writers that you are undoubtedly aware of. Ronan Farrow, who, of course, broke uh, those massive stories about Harvey Weinstein and Les Moonves. Um Helen Rosner, a James Beard award-winning food writer who contributes essays and reports and stories, all things gastronomique. Um, we just, uh, they just did a big story on uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, that was it. Everybody should read. Oh, I'm forgetting the author's name, but the profile on Tulsi Gabbard is really great. And, of course, Jane Myers there, the mayor. and uh, Isaac Chotner, um, who's... Um, Really interesting uh, interviewer. You can read a lot of his interviews in print, but he wrote a piece on how global warming changes international relations. Uh, there's, uh, what else did I, I mean, there is um, how how the garage became America's favorite room is on there. And, you know, we talk about design, uh, tons of stuff constantly. Well, they got a, a story <clears throat> On um, how, uh, you know, The Apprentice basically puffed up Donald Trump by somebody who worked there. All sorts of stuff that you can read from The New Yorker. And now our listeners can save 50% and get 12 weeks of The New Yorker for just six bucks. All you got to do is go to newyorker.com slash majority and enter majority. You'll also get an exclusive tote as well as unlimited access to New Yorker's apps, online archive, crossword puzzle, and newyorker.com with 10 to 15 exclusive site-only stories every day. That's newyorker.com slash majority. Enter the code majority. Get 12 weeks of the New Yorker for 6 bucks, Folks, do the math. That's 50 cents a week. That's crazy. Um, all right. I want to dig in just to a couple of things about the um, uh, the William Barr hearings. I mean, look, the um, the fact is, is that William Barr is a smarter Jeff Sessions. And the only question is, and by that I mean in terms of like race. Everybody's smarter than Jeff. Jeff's an idiot. Jeff's dumb. He's a hick. I um, hate him. Bill Barr is if you if you uh, enjoyed the idea that cops were able to basically have free reign and no record, there would be no oversight of the way that cops treat um, marginal communities, minority communities, really across the board. Well, then you're going to like Bill Barr, um, but that elections have consequences. And and this is what um, what came in with Donald Trump and with the Republicans, frankly, uh, particularly a, the, you know, the even more racialized uh, Republican Party as we have today. Um, the big issues in terms of of bar, of course, are. Things like, hey, uh, if Donald Trump and, and recall that uh, Rex Tillerson said, you know, sort of like as a joke. But not really. 
I had to tell Trump not to do illegal things all the time, right? I mean, that is the reporting that comes out. The question is, will a guy like Bill Barr also remind Donald Trump you can't do things illegally? Because once Bill Barr comes in here, there's there's a good chance we're going to see a full a wholesale clean, uh, you know, uh, cleaning house. And so there's not going to be many sane people left in there. And Bill Barr also wrote an 18 page memo to Donald Trump unsolicited. (laughs) Some people call it a job application where he basically outlined why um, it was impossible for there to be obstruction. Because collusion is not a crime. Now, of course, that's not what uh, Donald Trump is going to be charged with if he's charged with anything or if he can be charged. But the idea that obstruction um, cannot exist unless there's an underlying crime. Well, you can't prove an underlying crime a lot of times because of obstruction. You can't say. Um, well, you can't you can't arrest me for the uh, bank robbery because I, I drove the getaway car so well that you couldn't catch me. Exactly. Logic. Um, anyways, he wrote this uh, a 19-page unsolicited um, memo, and the the key questions are: Will Barr interfere with the investigation? Will Barr interfere with the release of the results? Will Barr, if Donald Trump says? Let it's time to arrest Hillary Clinton. I mean, these are legitimate questions. Not that far off. I'm laughing because, like, it's that's possibly in play. true. Exactly. Here is um, Bill Barr. This is his opening statements, right? Here we go. Listen to this. First, I believe it is vitally important that the special counsel be allowed to complete his investigation. I have known Bob Mueller for 30 years. We worked closely together throughout my previous tenure at the Department of Justice. We've been friends since, and I have the utmost respect for Bob and his distinguished record of public service. And when he was named special counsel, I said his selection was good news, and that knowing him, I had confidence he would handle the matter properly. And I still have that confidence today. Given his public actions to date, I expect that the special counsel is well along in his investigation. At the same time, the president has been steadfast that he was not involved in any collusion with Russian attempts to interfere in the election. I believe it is in the best interest of everyone, the president, Congress, and the American people, that this matter be resolved by allowing the special counsel to complete his work. The country needs a credible resolution to these issues. And if confirmed, I will not permit partisan politics, personal interests, or any other improper consideration to interfere with this or any other investigation. I will follow the special counsel regulations scrupulously and in good faith. And on my watch, Bob will be allowed to finish his work. You know, that would have been a great opportunity to say, and we will release this information to the public so the public will see the results of this investigation regardless of what it is. That's where you would have added that if that's what your intention was. So it's quite possible that over the past couple of months, Six months ago that when Bill Barr wrote that unsolicited 19 page memo saying there's it's impossible to find the president um, guilty, not even legally speaking. But that there is no it's not even a question of fact. This investigation, the investigation itself is impossible to find a violation by the president. Even if he has had a um, has reconsidered that perspective. The real question is, are we going to hear about it? Because it sounds to me like they have basically figured out a plan B. And plan B is to just basically suck this investigation down the drain. You finish. And when you're done, thank you. Goodbye. We'll just put it in the um, we'll put it in a file cabinet. Here is Leahy. Uh. 
asking more about that. And if confirmed, both seeking and following the advice of the department's career ethics officials. Oh, I'm sorry. Pause it. I'm sorry. This in this instance, right? The question's going to be. Uh, so Patrick Leahy, and this is what happened with Whitaker, and this is what happened with Jeff Sessions. There is an internal agency, essentially, within the DOJ. It's a committee, subcommittee, uh, made up of officials at the DOJ who assess whether there is a conflict of interest or an appearance of conflict of interest, which would require various officials to recuse themselves. Jeff Sessions, it was recommended to him by this ethics committee, recuse yourself. This is an internal DOJ uh, committee. You'll recall last time uh, Marcy Wheeler was on, she anticipated that this committee, made up of like four or five senior uh, DOJ officials, would tell Matt Whitaker to recuse himself. And then Matt Rit- Whitaker announced, they, they said, I'm okay. And it wasn't until like three or four weeks later that we hear the reporting that, in fact, no, he was told he should recuse himself. So the question becomes, with Bill Barr, if it's determined by other DOJ officials that because of your position in the past, it is best for, at the very least, the, 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 um, the optics... So that so that the American public can have confidence that the investigation is not being manipulated or buried or interfered with or underfunded or whatever it is. That you recuse yourself. Uh, Will you listen, unlike Matt Whitaker. To the recommendations of these uh, members of the Department of Justice. Here's the question. If confirmed, both seeking and following the advice of the department's career ethics officials on whether you must recuse from the special counsel's investigation. Uh, I I will seek uh, the advice of the career uh, ethics uh, personnel, but under the regulations, I make the decision as the head of the agency as to my own recusal. So I, I certainly would consult with them, and, and at the end of the day, I would make a decision uh, in good faith based on uh, the laws and the facts that are uh, evident at that time. Same thing if you're um, talking about a conflict of interest? Well, no, some conflicts, as you know, are, are mandatory. Yeah. Thank you. So, and, and, and there's also obviously another way that you could have responded to this. I will give deference to that committee. They will have a priority. It's conceivable that I would disagree with what they would say, but I would show deference to them. But not, I'm just going to listen to them when they give their proclamation. Everybody gets a say, man. That's I mean, right. I'll hear them and I hear you right now. Everybody Look, talks, in, everybody shares their feelings, bro. In other words, there's no commitment from this guy that he's going to um, not be essentially corrupt. Oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, pardon me, sir. Uh, I just gave you a commitment to listen, I believe. That's, that's right. He's going to go on a listening tour. This is a guy who put in, who submitted a 19-page uh, memo saying that there is no even construction in which you could uh, be considered guilty because the charges themselves don't even, uh, they, they, they can't, even if true, they can't be true. Even if you obstructed, it's not po- it would not be possible for you to obstruct. Well, I am totally willing to hear you out on that. Now, um, he's going to, you know, he's going to be the next AG. Uh, but he does seem quite a bit more savvy than Sessions. I right. mean, you know, he could, I mean, who knows? Maybe he'll be totally shambolic the next couple of weeks and I'll stand corrected. Yeah. Well, he does seem a lot more kind of adroit at manipulating this look, process. It's not inconceivable. I mean, you know, these days it's not inconceivable that, um, you know, this guy's a former, uh, uh, Reagan official. 
uh, a G, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush office, official, maybe um, maybe some of these old lined uh, Republicans said, oh, do the old um, uh, write a 19 page memo trick where it sounds like you'll totally uh, be on board. We can sell him on you. And then uh, you get in there and you actually function like a, you know, a real attorney general, a real Republican one who's just going to use the power of the office to make sure that black people don't have any redress. You know, but, I'm really but we'll sick <laughs> of people coming in here and only targeting black people. And that's not my problem. Obviously, targeting black people is great. But at a certain point, you need to take care of numero uno. Exactly. And first, Mr. Magoo, the dumb inbred guy doesn't do it. And now he writes a whole 19 page memo, and all of a sudden I'm still being harassed. This is really unfair. Now I know what it feels like to be a black guy, ironically. <laughs> totally unfair. Um, meanwhile, the Republicans have discovered that Steve King is uh, racist. And this is sort of fascinating um, when you see the implications of the Democrats taking uh, the House. Um, Mitch McConnell has stated, as of yesterday, there is no place in the Republican Party, the Congress, or the country for an ideology of racial supremacy of any kind. Representative King's statements are unwelcome and unworthy of his elected position. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> as you know, this is uh, huge uh, breaking news that... Um, Stephen King is now a racist, uh, apparently. Uh, this is uh, huge breaking news, particularly since uh, only three months ago. Well, here's a picture of, um, who is it? That's not uh, McConnell with Stephen King. Uh, that's just, um, you know, when this guy tells you that you've got a racist problem, you know you have a problem. But um, let's look in on Chuck Grassley, who only three months ago uh, said Steve King was great. It's amazing the transformation that Stephen King has had. Like, what happened in the past three months that made this guy turn so um, so horrible? I mean, just three months ago, here was uh, Chuck Grassley uh, basically having a stroke. I mean, endorsing uh, Steve King. Iowa needs Steve King in Congress. I also need Steve King in Congress. Pause it for one I, second. That actually sounds really. I, I he, even I am like. I know I don't it's a little bit upsetting. That, but yeah. but uh, let's let's but let's uh, go back to the beginning here and okay. just like here's a tip for all of you congressional staffers who listen to the program, watch the show. If you're going to uh, videotape your uh, boss and uh, put it on the web, There's you have two options. One is you either cut out the part where you go three, two, one, <laughs> or you use your fingers. See, that's why, like, I mean, if you were counting down from, let's say, 36, this would be uncomfortable, but you're doing three, two, two, one. Iowa needs Steve King in Congress. I also need Steve King in Congress. I feel like I do a good job of representing Iowans. And so often, I have found Steve King to be such an ally, an ally that I need in the other body called the House of Representatives. Uh, he's worked with so many things that are important to Iowa, agricultural issues, the farm bill, uh, alternative energy, uh, things that are uh, very important to Iowa, like wind energy particularly. Oh, and ethanol and biodiesel as well. Uh, without his help in the House of Representatives, uh, Iowa... All right, he goes be... on and on. We don't need to hear uh, this. Ethanol, the point is, well, the... Uh, energy, uh, protecting white babies. What? Now, they... Restart. Uh, they... The... Um, <laughs> Kevin McCarthy, uh, or Steve McCarthy, as we like to call him, has said that King will not be sitting on any, will not get any committee appointments. The The big deal uh, for this is right there in Grassley's comments, because uh, King will no longer be on the Agriculture Committee, which means that um, he will no longer be able to offer um, all sorts of bennies for... Um, uh, for um, 
Iowans and 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 uh, big ag there. And so this is going to um, he's going to if he's not reinstated, and I don't think he will be, he will lose uh, in a uh, Republican primary. And he's already got, uh, I think, a couple weeks ago, some some local Iowa Republican announced he was going to take him on. Yeah. And it was all like. You know, this is tasteless, but like it's a distraction. It's embarrassing, and now you got the you know now there's the meat to fill it in. Right, he'll it's be knocked really, out, and he'll really be... it must have been really a big surprise for all these Republicans to find out that Steve King was such a, a jerk. It's shocking. It's, it's a shame they couldn't have found that out before the election, and they could have worked with us to get him out of office. Yeah, but you know the the information comes fast. I'm sure Steve King will like you know make a nice living like addressing like. European like fascist soccer clubs yeah. and oh, stuff like he's World got a Net whole Daily, other, World yeah. Net Daily has already started to build his set I think and, right. and but the, this is the, here's the interesting part uh, there's a lot of people who are probably wondering like why now and it is because um, the Democrats have the ability to control the agenda in the House and. That makes Steve King more of a liability than he was two months ago. And they had the ability to vote to censure him, which would have kept it in the news. And the Republicans thought, OK, this is this is the definition of this guy taking one for the team. And it also gives us a, an opportunity to uh, talk about uh Rashida Tlaib and the fact that uh, the Democrats won't censure her for saying mofo. Well, and also she said that uh, Arab civilization can't be saved with gypsy babies. That's right. And that because we created fucking algebra was, I believe, the direct quote. And uh, just because she thinks that the Arabs are particularly blessed by Allah doesn't mean that she thinks that Allah's other creations aren't valid, but just inferior right so i think we need to be really fair here right. about what she actually said i love how my rashida to lips also just jimmy door right exactly <laughs> we created but, fucking but this algebra is, this you fucking is, i mean sellouts. this is it i mean it's basically look they are in a um the, the they are on the back of their heels because they're getting blamed for the shutdown they did not want the twin sort of like uh, recommendations of being uh, coddling to a racist and also uh, denying basic services to Americans. Oh, I thought hey, you were saying to be check. coddling by, coddling to a racist and coddling to a racist. It right. takes two to tango. That's right. Don't forget. Yeah. Uh, we Look, we're all implicated in this, too, because we all heard what Stephen King said. And uh, if we hadn't heard what he said, then... Would he have said it? Right. On we one are, hand, Steve King is saying absolutely racist things. On the other hand, we're a lot of listening. Democrats are hearing what he's saying. So there's a lot on both sides of this, Kathy. Back um, to you. Just, just briefly, um, judge orders uh, the Trump administration to remove the 2020 citizen, uh, census citizenship question. You remember this story? Uh, a question was added to the uh, 2020 census, which would have been about um, the uh, citizenship status of um, of someone in the census. Now, look, the census is a constitutionally mandated exercise. And it is specifically to count all the people in the United States, not all the citizens, not all the adults, not all the uh, Americans all the people in the United States. And when you ask a question about citizenship, it scares off a lot of people. This was a question that the census people did not want to put in there. It was a question that came, or I should say, rather, it was a question that came from the the political, not from any, there was no valid reason to put it in. Um. U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York has been hearing the lawsuit over this. Uh, apparently, the um, there's it's anticipated that this may go to the Supreme Court. Um, Wilbur Ross testified, or at least in written testimony, um, 
It's basically been showing that the administration has been misleading the public. They misused, uh, Ross, that is, misused his authority over the census and discriminated against immigrant communities of color. Um, It's not the end of this, but it is another indication or another example of why the uh, federal judiciary is important. Here's another one. Um, There are two judges that, one in California, one in Pennsylvania, both uh, federal judges, which have uh, at least temporarily blocked Trump administration rules that would limit the ability of some women to get birth control at no charge. The idea was that Trump administration was expanding the uh, principle in the Hobby Lobby case to not just religion, but moral qualms with people, uh, women taking birth control. And so the the methodology that the Obama administration had come up with in working in doing workarounds where the companies would not have to touch the money and would not have to pay extra money. Well, they weren't going to pay extra money anyways, but would not have to touch the money that would go to the insurance company that would offer this as a benefit. And that is the most milquetoast liberal thing I've ever heard. What's Well, they had to get around the Supreme Court. I know. It's just funny. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. But um, there's no other means in which to do it. You, I mean, the, the, the other means to do it would, of course, been to not have health insurance in any way tied to employers. Um, but they had worked out a workaround where a third-party insurer would cover birth control even if the employer did not. Because when you get um, health insurance from employers, it's the employers who pay for it. Um, And so that was the workaround the Trump administration wanted to end that. And two federal judges, both appointed by Barack Obama, um, have at least, at the very least, uh, enjoined the administration to do that in the meantime. Also, the U.S. Supreme Court on Monday denied um, cert. In other words, they're not going to look at the case brought by a Texas bank saying that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was unconstitutional because the president cannot fire the director without cause. The court didn't hear it because Kavanaugh is recused because he heard a similar case at the circuit level. It would have been 4-4. It wasn't worth their time. They're going to wait till they get another case that Kavanaugh can rule on in this instance. Uh, Not necessarily a bad thing, because by the time this case gets up there, you'll have a Democratic president, hopefully, who can then fire Donald Trump's um, head of Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But the Republicans hate this agency. It was set up very deftly by Elizabeth Warren. So in anticipating this being a um, an agency that was going to be the subject of Republican ire and and, and not just Republican, but um, the banking industry. And so it was set up in such a way that uh, it was self-funding and could not be attacked easily. And it has, it has worked from an administrative standpoint. It was sort of a, a brilliant uh, structure. Um, just got a little bit of time here. So I want to talk about this ridiculously stupid Jonathan Chait um, uh, piece. Here we go. May I say, go off, King. Well, this... Okay. <laughs> okay. So Jonathan Chait, I don't know. This is just... I've never seen anything this sort of nakedly stupid uh, by someone who is ostensibly uh, respected by... The um, I, I think a, an increasingly smaller and narrower band of people. I mean, at, at one point, Jonathan Chait, who is uh, ostensibly a uh, a Democratic partisan, um, 
is going to end up being a a member of the sort of uh, the Bill Crystal uh, never Trumper, never AOCer. Yeah, I mean, oh well, without a doubt. <laughs> or they'll but join he's, the Democratic. But party. he's attacked uh, Elizabeth Warren, and he writes. The concerns I have, well, here's the headline. What happens when Elizabeth Warren sells out to powerful interests? Now, may I ask a question? So is he doing a hypothetical scenario where Elizabeth Warren caves to the credit card industry and she reverses herself on the history of her advocacy of financial reform? Is that what when he's talking I about? When I saw the headline, I was like, mm, that, yeah, people will be bummed. Or maybe he's talking about, like, what happens when she has to compromise on something are the, you know, purity trolls going to have a vision? And I, and I was like, I'm not reading another one of those dumb Jonathan Chait things that are like hippie punching because that's usually what he writes. Right. Like and so uh, I, I was bored at that, but I didn't realize how stupid this piece could be. So he writes the concerns I have about Warren as a policymaker and not the issues she talks about, but the issues she doesn't. Here are two issues where I believe Warren has done the wrong thing. There's a common theme here. They challenge and complicate her populist appeal. Now, the reason why he picks two things is because he wants to launder one of them. (laughs) The first is the medical device tax. One of the ways the Affordable Care Act was funded was via the medical device tax. And... The Democrats, when they controlled the Senate under Obama, were coming very close to repealing the medical device tax. Al Franken was one of the people who wanted to do that because Minnesota has a big medical device industry. Guess what else does? Massachusetts. Lots of devices. This repeal of the medical device tax, right? particularly in the shadow now of a $1.5 trillion uh, giveaway to corporate taxes, or the Chuck Schumer plan to repatriate offshore taxes is negligible. Is it something that I uh, am in favor of? Absolutely not. But the idea that this has been sticking in Jonathan Chait's uh, crotch or craw or whatever it is, wherever he's been keeping it, for this time is impossible. The idea that this is some type of deal breaker that people are going to care about in this day and age, the medical device tax after there's been a $1.5 trillion corporate tax giveaway after the repatriation, which Chuck Schumer and Hillary Clinton and Paul Ryan had planned as per Chuck Schumer's bragging in October of 2016 is just absurd. It's absurd. And I love the fact that he leads with it because he thinks he's being clever. Because what's his real agenda? What he's really concerned about is... Now, this is something that she's co-sponsored legislation to repeal the the medical device tax. She's written an op-ed advocating the tax repeal for the industry's own newsletter and proposed a bill that would penalize manufacturers of pharmaceuticals, but crucially not the medical device industry, for misappropriating funds intended for scientific research. So in other words, she has been really good at going after big pharma, which is actually, you know, one of the bigger problems. But not so much with the medical device industry. Um, that we're We're... We're splitting hairs here, particularly based upon what issues this guy's had in the past. But whatever. I agree with him. We shouldn't have a repeal of the medical device tax. But this is like the idea that this would derail uh, derail Elizabeth Warren. This is sort of like um, a version of Bernie Sanders and guns if guns were a wholly irrelevant issue to the entire country. But then there was oh another thing too. Now that I'm now that I'm writing this piece, um, I'm going to write another thing about it: education reform. <laughs> so, a valid although unbelievably narrow right. uh, objection to set the stage for the real aim of the piece, right? Which is that Elizabeth Warren has sold out to powerful interests. In this instance, 
the teachers, the national teachers, dun, you know, dun, dun. a very, very small constituency of the Democratic Party, right? Like, um, I mean, this guy, even if this guy had written this five years ago, it would have seemed awkward. But right now, it's just incredibly tone deaf and stupid. There may be no state in America that can clearly, uh, more clearly showcase the clear success of charter schools than Warren's home state of Massachusetts. Professors Sarah Cahodes and Susan Dynarski conducted a study proving the massive gains produced by charter school students in the Bay State. Because Massachusetts has a cap on the number of students allowed to attend charters, its students have to enter a lottery to apply. This allowed Cahodes and Donarski to compare the performance of students who won the lottery with those who lost a perfectly randomized sample across a broad suite of metrics. Uh, the students who won the lottery and attended a charter outperformed the lottery losers in every way. State test scores, SAT scores, number of advanced placement classes, test scores in those classes and college attendance. OK. Let's just stipulate. That this uh, study. Was done. Uh, perfectly well and is accurate that those people who applied for the lottery and got in and went to the charter schools did better than those who applied for the lottery and didn't get in. And so you are eliminating at least the control of uh, parents who are equally motivated to be involved in their, their kids' education. You can't necessarily make up for maybe the disappointment that the kids, that the parents feel, you know, and maybe they're a little bit less engaged in the kids. But but let's just let that ride. OK. Let's just imagine that you that is a, a perfect test and you can you can measure that. Um, the gains were equally large or larger for low income students, students who entered school, low test scores, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the charter sector would like to admit more students in Massachusetts, but the state has a cap preventing more students from enrolling. There was a state referendum in 2016 to increase the cap. And the teachers union spearheaded uh, the, the opposition to this measure. And Warren also joined that opposition to question two which he writes crushed the chance for thousands of low income urban students in Massachusetts to have a chance at a great education and a future in college. Okay. <clears throat> now, first of all, his characterization, uh, that last line there, it did not crush the chance for thousands of low income urban students in Massachusetts to have a chance at great education and a future in college. Because the thing that he also doesn't mention is that public schools in Massachusetts outperform all other schools around the country. So while even if we stipulate this study is absolutely accurate, there's no indication that these people, uh, that these students in the public schools didn't have the same opportunity to get into uh, colleges or have a future. That's not what the study measures. The study measures SAT scores, certain percentage increase in SAT scores, and certain skill sets. A. B. What he doesn't mention about uh, Massachusetts charter schools is that they are unique in that Massachusetts has an incredible amount of control as a state over the authorization of these schools, over the accreditation of these schools, over the entire process of these schools. Massachusetts has a better system to deal with charters. There's a lot of research that also suggests the reason why charters do well in Massachusetts is because the public schools themselves do well. Because there's an already a large foundation for public schooling in Massachusetts. And thereby the charters are platformed on that. But the other reality is, is that every time you put money into a charter school, what you're doing is you're taking money out of the public schools. So there very well could be a point of diminishing returns. Charter schools are not set up to be an alternate form of education in a locale. It's supposed to be a mechanism in which to provide 
a laboratory to enhance public education so that ideas can be uh, uh, dealt with in charter schools that may have a little bit more flexibility, but then be scaled up. It is not meant to be a, um, a replacement for public schools. And the fact is, is that there is certainly a time without a cap, there's certainly a point where you start to undercut public schools for, the, for all students. Not to mention the fact that that's important because charter schools, even if it's lottery, don't take the same array of students that the public schools do. You still have rules and where people can be kicked out of. Even if Massachusetts charter schools are not like the vast majority of charter schools, which are for-profit. Because the for-profit ones are not allowed in Massachusetts. Um, The reality is they do inhibit the quality of public schools. And there is, like I say, a lot of evidence that shows to the extent that you have charter schools succeed in a place like New Jersey or Massachusetts, it's a function of the underlying public school system. So if you start robbing Peter to pay Paul, Paul's actually going to start doing worse as well. Not to mention all the other... um, apostles who uh, aren't, can't, aren't allowed to get into the charter school. Yeah, but they break the power of those greedy, greedy teachers unions. Well, that turns out to be the sellout to the powerful interest. Now, mind you, the money on the pro-charter side was much bigger. So the problem Elizabeth Warren has is she sells out to the lower bidder. You just imagine a teacher like rolling a gold plated pencil across the desk towards her like, here, have this apple. Exactly. My concern is what these issues tell us about Warren as a policymaker. She has done an effective job of mobilizing public opinion against the finance industry, which has many nefarious impacts on public policy. Oh, incidentally, the biggest contributors uh, to this charter movement, because they know there's tons of money to be made in the other states. Even if Massachusetts at this moment does not allow for-profit charter schools, there's tons of money for these big financiers to make in other states. Hedge funds are deep into the charter movement. But presidents have to deal with all the issues, and many of them have organized lobbyists defending terrible policies that fly under radar. There's no such thing as a perfectly pure politician, of course. But from my standpoint, medical device tax repeal (laughs) and the Massachusetts Charter Cap, I mean, the entire ACA is founded on such compromises. And the idea that the medical device uh, repeal is the one that really sticks out in his mind is just laughable. It definitely was not the lack of a public option. That was not it. Definitely not it. Or the the, the lack of negotiating with drug prices with pharmaceuticals. No, 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 no. Keep your eye on the ball. Or the idea of massive subsidies to the insurance companies. The whole thing was a compromise bill. Do you have some money tied up in a Worcester medical device company that you're downplaying? Maybe maybe I do. But from my standpoint, the medical device tax repeal and the Massachusetts charter cap are especially unjustifiable policies. First of all, the fact that that charter schools in Massachusetts do marginally better than public schools for kids, even if that was provable, does not mean that capping how many students go into charter schools is a bad policy that just doesn't follow. On Twitter, Chait was questioned about this. Like, uh, dude, um, there were two powerful interests, one that had more money than the other, and she went with the one that had the less money in this fight in Massachusetts. And his response was fascinating, insight. Um, it's behind there. It's it's behind the uh, it's behind the razor one. See it on the left? Oh no, no, I guess it isn't. Sorry. Um, his response was fascinating, and it was fascinating because uh, he doesn't realize what a cell phone it is. Aside from it being something that he writes, um, uh, so someone says to him, 
Oh, he's talking about, incidentally, the forces that were for this were hit with the largest uh, fine in state campaign history for illegally hiding the identities of its billionaire donors. Um, and uh, Ben Mathis Lilly says, if it's uh, selling out to the powerful to not support that group, it seems like maybe selling out is not the right frame for that issue. And Chait says the interest group in this issue holds power over Warren's political future is the teachers union. If it was a Republican, the calculus would be different. The donors to the charter schools may be rich, but their interest in this issue is philanthropic, <laughs> making it quite different than an interest group protecting its own income. Now, here's aside from that wow. being astronomically um, uh, disingenuous. A couple, couple of uh, Pinocchios there. A couple of Pinocchios, okay, because uh, the donors to charter schools in Massachusetts and the charter school First of all, they're not donating to the charter schools. They're donating to a political action committee or trying to expand charters. It's a commons they want to privatize, you dense moron. And they want to do this in other states where they make a ton of money. So, But even if we were to believe that the reason why these billionaires are all giving money to the charter movement because it's a philanthropic um, endeavor, and that they are giving the money not to the charter schools themselves, and of course not to public schools uh, with no strings attached, but to the political action committee supporting charters, even if we were completely moronic enough to believe this, this last part, making it quite different than an interest group protecting its own income. What he's saying is that when you're talking about protecting your own income and you're advocating for something, that is extremely suspicious. That is extremely suspicious. And so when you have a scenario where someone's advocating for something like that and their income is in any way involved, you should not take what they're saying seriously or at being in any way an honest reflection of their opinion. Well, sadly, Jonathan Chait's wife <laughs> works for <laughs> charter schools. My uh, wife! Uh, you didn't sell my wife, Anna. This is the same guy who like was like, oh, I can't believe we unionized. My current boss is the nicest boss now, I ever had. I happen to believe that uh, it's possible... That the teachers, even though uh, the teachers union, even though it would protect their own income, that they actually have the education of students in mind. That's b a big reason why you go into education. But um, you go there for the cold, hard currency. This is the George Mason economics also, by the way, this public choice theory sort of. Oh, thing. right. Yeah. Of course. This yep. is all that yep. is. Oh, yeah. Which is doubly ironic because the only. But she worked for a charter school. For, for a charter and the school only network. public Wildly. value. Wildly irresponsible of New York Magazine not to make him disclose that in this piece. And the, it's also, he, yes, absolutely. Every time he writes about charter schools, he should he should be saying that. Like I, I'm not the kind of scab to like try to tweet at someone's employer in an effort to get them fired. But uh, if if I'd scab on anyone, it would probably be Jonathan Shay because he's also a scab. Yeah, he's already scabbed earlier yeah. this fall. You scab, you get who scabs scab. the scabs? We are scab, but I but also like. The only thing Jonathan Shade has ever done that has like any credibility is, you know, writing. I mean, frankly, pretty easy pieces about why like libertarian economics is delusional, and here he is forwarding it in the entire public education arena, yeah, without disclosing a massive conflict of interest. Well, I mean, a, 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 a one that he actually believes is necessarily a conflict of interest, right? You can't possibly advocate for something that protects your income in any fashion. Oh, he's such a dumbass. It's unbelievable. I mean, if we're going to cherry pick statistics, maybe we should talk about all of the studies that found uh, charter schools have often horrible racial disparities in their punishment well, of students. That's simply a fact. It's uh, They have uh, disparities in that regard. They don't have the same obligations around the country to um, to let in all sorts of students from public schools. They don't outperform, broadly speaking, across the nation. Uh, public schools. So the idea that Massachusetts is limiting the number of, of charter schools, the idea that that is inherently a bad policy is just absurd. It's just absurd.
absurd. It's not, and particularly in the context of criticizing her as a national candidate. Yeah, this whole piece is bloated with neoliberal ideology, right? But, well, it's, this whole piece that's is the a best thing a, you could say about it. Yeah, the whole this whole piece is a is a good reminder of um, even as I prefer Bernie and critique her, the uh, really admirable parts of well, Elizabeth Warren's record. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, uh, if you're Warren, this send him so a champagne. Bad. Send this, him a cigar. This Jonathan Chape is so bad that it has occurred to me that Warren's people paid him to write it. It's well, that, that would, it's that bad. My respect levels for Warren's people and Jonathan Chape would skyrocket right. if that was the case. He could very well be a a a secret huge proponent of Elizabeth Warren and realize I got to take one for the team. This is the only way I can help. Could you write a massively, unbelievably, just embarrassingly stupid piece without disclosing a conflict of interest for us? All right. Sure. You know what? The mission is more important than my ego. That's all I can do. So New York Magazine just unionized, and that's pretty cool. Oh, just this moment? Uh very recently. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was crying about it. Oh, yeah. And he was upset. When that happened, I said, Hey, you know what, guys? You just unionized. Why don't we bring back a little social unionism, a little social consciousness to your union demands? So in addition to, you know, better wages, better benefits, whatever, whatever, I think it would be to the benefit of everyone in society if you make firing Jonathan Chait one of your demands in your contract. So that would be pretty we'll fun. see how that goes. All right. We got to take a break, head into the fun half. Um, we will have uh, aerial footage for the first day of the L.A. teacher strike, which was pretty impressive. Um, and, um, well, we got a couple more things to talk about. Got some about. good Rand Paul stuff. Coming. Yeah, we got some Rand Paul. Constitution. We, we, we might have a uh, Roots Rand Paul. Take, uh, take your number, your phone call, 646-257-3920. I'm turning on the uh, phone system now. Also, your IMs. Uh, reminder, this program exists because of our members. You can become a member at majority dot, uh, join the majority report.com. Uh, tomorrow, I think we're going to play the live show that we did on Sunday. Uh, so you will, uh, be able to hear that and maybe uh, see that. And, um, uh, we decided to release to everybody. Why not? And, just a reminder, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Oh, members, I should say, also to this program, get the uh, show commercial free. So uh, no ads for you. Uh, today is Tuesday. Uh, that is the Michael Brooks show day. Uh, and as such, there will be a Michael Brooks show tonight. Is that correct, Michael? Indeed. Anna Kasparian from the Young Turks, uh, our friend, will be joining us. She's not gonna, is she be in studio? Uh, no, she'll be over the phone. Um, and uh, we're also going to, of course, talk about the news coming out of Brexit, a uh, bunch of, and also get into Francis Fox Piven's regulating the poor and how it relates to understanding the government shutdown, a bunch of other stuff. And uh, the Majority Report live show was incredibly fun, and it was an honor to meet uh, people and uh, come out and see the TMBS live show February 1st. Get your tickets. Today. That's a seven p.m. show. Seven right? p.m. show a on drinking. a Friday night. On a so Friday a night. Little drinking going it. on. Get it started. And uh, actually, I think after the show's over, there's a dance party that the Bell House uh, hosts. So you could really just stay there and have a great night. Um, so yeah, come to the show. Uh, we're streaming live at the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel, starting at around seven ish. And uh, Jamie, what's happening with the Antifada? So this week for our patrons only, we have a real poly hours in which we break down an article from QZ.com about the polyamorous community. Uh, and you know what? I'm going to leave it a little uh, a little vague until you listen. What our take is on it is polyamory bourgeois decadence that only serves to aggrandize our tech bro overlords. Or is it a totally normal and fine life choice? That Here's my impression of Sean. Leave us alone about people should be uh, in monogamous relationships and not ever stray sexually because it's counter revolutionary. I, gu I guess you'll see the show. I guess you'll see if that's accurate or yeah. not. We also recorded a episode about this very crazy Trotsky series on Netflix, which uh, actually kind of ties in in a weird way. Like there's this funny scene where uh, 
Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera and Trotsky are all like running around playing grab ass, uh, trying to get this uptight Stalinist guy to join their polycule. And he's like, I don't know about this. So uh, it, it, it ties in, in in strange ways that we weren't expecting. So that'll be out soon, too. Also, Sean recorded a new History is a Weapon last night with a very special guest. And that will also be out very soon for everybody. Ooh, I'm Trotsky. Uh, literary Hangover coming out, recording on uh, Thursday on The House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. A uh, very interesting book about how terrible uh, inheritance is. So uh, look forward to that. All right. Both and. 646-257-3920 is the number. We'll turn on the IMM machine right now. See you in the fun half. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer.